Written by Adam M. Booth. Narrated by Rob Gull. For all the Angelas. From the other place I sing this song. A starling song of love gone wrong. Two birds. Angela was one of only two people to go into work on the Thursday between Christmas and New Year. Christmas, as ever, had been a solitary experience, and when she'd been asked if she could perhaps make it in to do the mandatory reports one morning between the two holidays, she agreed, but did her best to make her answer look reluctant. Yes, she said, she should be back from a delayed Christmas dinner at her cousin's house in Newcastle and would probably be able to make it in. She had sighed and grunted about it all afternoon, and the people with whom she sold health insurance to the great British public understood how greatly she had been inconvenienced. But there would be no Christmas dinner. There wasn't even a cousin. There was nobody, and Angela had been hoping they would ask her to do this for months. As the bearded spectre of Christmas loomed up at her out of autumnal hues, she had clutched her chest and begged the night for it. For someone, for anyone. She arrived to the wide empty office, and, from a grid of switches, turned on just the lights above her bank of desks. The stark lights clattered above her as they warmed up, and the comma of a moon that punctuated the sky outside illuminated nothing, leaving the vast room almost completely black, except for the cold pool of light she settled in. She arranged her desk, and although it was cold and dark out there, Angela's heart kindled its own flame and beat like a flaming bird in a cage of bone as she waited for her manager to arrive. Veronica had never been late, not once in almost four decades. In fact, she was never less than 15 minutes early. It was one of the many ways she managed to stand proud in a crowd, catching the attention of light and men with such casual ease. Angela couldn't help but admire her, and she couldn't help but be cast into her shadow. It was a darkness that Angela had come to love after years in its comfortable shade. But back when the light was anyone's for the taking, Veronica's extreme earliness had forced Angela to arrive earlier still, or feel second best in too many ways. So began a silent competition that spanned an age, each shaving precious seconds off their shrinking lives, throwing them on the pyre of time that burned them away, each trying to prove themselves keener to the powers that be, before Veronica had become manager of the department, when they were still equal in one way at least. It was an ugly dance, full of waste and pride, and in truth, Veronica's eventual trophy life, with the title and the husband and the swan-like grace, had less to do with her timekeeping and more to do with the shape of her body, a competition in which Angela just couldn't compete, and, if she was honest, was the same reason she now went to the bathroom and applied a smudge of lipstick to her thin, dry lips. Maybe she considered idly as she smeared herself in red grease. She had even been complicit in Veronica's win, her adoration contributing to the consensus. But as much as she resented it, old habits die hard. And so here she was, very old, very hard, and very, very early. Veronica arrived at 8.04am, and to Angela she was as beautiful as she had ever been. Her 59 years had made their mark, that couldn't be argued. But Angela saw through the lines and looseness and liver marks to the tight little thing that used to strut back and forth around these same desks all those years ago. In those heels. She remembered those heels, those slicing, spiking heels, her legs so long and lean. Veronica joined Angela in her pool of light and her eyes ate her up. Gold rings and clumped mascara, coal on spider legs, 
her body draped in a sequined black dress that hugged her hills and caressed her valleys, and a pair of pink-rimmed glasses perched on her perfect little nose. Angela recognised the dress. It was from Next. I like your dress, Angela said. Veronica nodded as if her adoration was a foregone conclusion, and her sequins winked in sequence as she drifted by, like a tired old peacock displaying threadbare plumage. She was overdressed and she knew it, but she had always liked to let a glimmer of her dinner party lifestyle leak into the nine to fives. Still, Angela marvelled at the display, and as Veronica walked around her to her own desk, she noticed a whisper of the elegant grace that hadn't completely left her, despite being on her second hip. They said their hellos, complained about the TV over Christmas, and began their work. How was your dinner at your cousin's? Fine. It was fine. The potatoes were dry. Their shared history echoed between their small talk and over time's barren plains. All the meetings and supervisions, the birthday meals and office parties, the leaving dues and redundancies, like crystal sculptures that only they could see. Once all those numbers had been entered into those black and blue screens, Veronica packed up her belongings and told Angela, sat alone, that she had to nip to the loo, but then she'd have to be leaving because her boys were waiting for her to eat. Angela blinked and nodded, then stared into the space Veronica left behind. She considered following her into the little pink bathroom and holding the door closed, holding her down and doing the things she'd dreamed of so many times, taking what she had never been given. Trembling, she blinked twice more, waited for the bathroom door to swing shut, then grabbed her bag and trotted to the front door as quickly as her short wide legs would carry her. She fell out into a wind in the pale blue street, wiping a scrag of black hair out of her small wet eyes then took the waiting train out of the ice-grey station and was home before the lights above her vacant desk had cooled. She slammed the front door shut, ran upstairs to the second bedroom, and I watched through a tear in the celestial cloth as my daughter put two nails through two small blue birds. In between. It had been a grey Christmas in every way imaginable. Snow didn't fall, bells didn't ring, and the empty hours yawned in her face, begging to be filled. She did her best. She bathed in the static of the TV and the gentle wind from the wings of the many birds in her second bedroom. She wrote lists of things she didn't really need from town, and from time to time she let her mind into the life of her friend from work who would not think of Angela at all. She pictured Veronica cooking and cleaning and undressing for bed and finally seeing behind the clothes she hid in and into the rawness beyond. She smiled at the thought and looked out of the wide kitchen window at a sky that wasn't so much a sky as a ceiling. In the very early hours of New Year's Eve, Angela dressed in a pair of old jeans, a woolly jumper and an anorak. She packed an orange, and one of her small metal cages into a black leatherette trolley and set off into town, where the sun rose only a little into a space slightly outside of time. She went the long way, through the gloom, along the path and up into the park on the hill. There was no one there. She'd been counting on it. And anyway, even if there had been others, the kind of people that made it out at that time could only see themselves. She got up to the high point of the park, where rooks wheeled overhead like flying black daggers stabbing the sky. There she bent down and removed the cage from the trolley. The birds in the trees swivelled their heads, their black diamond eyes glinting cold and knowing. She dragged herself and the rattling cage into the shade between shrubs and bushes, then clambered through them, through the deep shadow of the trees, feeling her way through the murk along the ground back to the damp, soft place where the fence of the old estate behind the park began. She set the little larsen trap on a small shelf she'd nailed up years ago, filled it with seed, then made her way out. Back in the light, she brushed herself off and walked down into town, where she sat on a green bench, ate her orange, and waited for the shops to open. She needed margarine, glue and disinfectant, 
and she made herself think about all the beatings she took as a child. She took so many. The Grindstone On the first day back in work, Sheila called in sick, so Angela had to do the work of two people. She spent the morning grey in resentment, her face pressed against it, warping her features. Veronica asked her how the rest of her break had been, and Angela told her that she'd been bored, but that really only scratched the surface of the monolithic truth which was that every day spent in the house with only herself and 72 strangely silent birds was like sinking into a sea of black oil, endless and viscous. Veronica guffawed at the revelation. Bored? I wish I'd had time to be bored. The boys kept me so busy I didn't get two minutes to myself. Veronica's beautiful voice went on and on, singing of parties and people and places Angela would never see. Well, I finished my puzzle book, and my birds keep me busy, Angela interjected. You and those birds, said Veronica, smiling and tutting all at once, and Angela understood that in every way she was less than the woman with the devoted husband, loving son, and designated parking space. The weeks drew on, and nothing much happened. Angela spent as much time as she could in the company of her birds her beloved little birds, sat in their midst where she whistled Alouetta with the world just a square of sky on the other side of a roof window. Amongst them, locked in the second bedroom of her semi-detached suburban box, she felt understood. I remember the first bird. It was the day before I left her. A small brown sparrow flew in through her bedroom window. She pulled the window closed behind it and the little bird never left. That night she sat on Angela's stubby little finger and chirped for her mother as Angela looked into her little eyes and pretended the insistent song was for her. Angela! Veronica shouted, and Angela blinked an inky blackness from her mind. She was back in the room. You might want to answer the phone! Veronica pointed a knuckly ringed finger at the chirping beige box bound to Angela's head by a curly black wire. Sorry. Angela said. I've had a headache. Well, take some tablets and get on with it. I don't want to be back in there with you next month. Pointing that same finger at the private office at the end of a long, dark corridor. Veronica leaned in and whispered. Maybe if you lost some weight, you'd feel better. Wouldn't get so many headaches. Are you still going to Weight Watchers? I think it would do you the world of good. Get you out the house. Meet people. Angela lied with a nod and answered the insistent little box tied to her head. And although her mouth shaped words and her own crooked fingers made things happen on a screen, in her mind she was flying through the night, tears stinging cold in the wind, with sharp claws and a razored beak. The Pitch It was a Saturday, and Angela took the train to the place where I would take her as a child. It was just a grassy embankment overlooking a football pitch, where a team with no name would play games that didn't matter on Saturday afternoons. I'd take her there with sandwiches, and she would sit away from me and eat them so gingerly, always watching me, always watching. It was as though she knew I would leave her, it was my way of saying sorry, you see. Sorry for the things I hadn't done yet. Sorry for the things I had. It wasn't enough. On the train, my grown-up Angela listened to a woman speak about the death of her infant grandson in that bleak way that only women of a certain age and from a certain part of Liverpool can. Her words were quiet and slid out of her like wet slate under the grey sky. The train pulled into the flickering station, and she stepped off it into disinfectant, diesel and tobacco smoke. The walk from the station to the grassy knoll took twenty minutes between semis and garages, and when she got to the pitch, the grey rain began, 
and she ate three jam sandwiches in the same spot she had all those years ago, with her anorak pulled up over her head. No one played football, no one passed her by, and ninety minutes later she retreated down the same path and boarded the return train. From the window of the train from Liverpool to Preston, she saw a body in the shrubs at the side of the track. Grey skin, blue jeans, face down. She mentioned it to no one, and now somehow, in death, he was hers. She's leaving. Janet is leaving. 23 years after walking through those doors for the first time, she's leaving. Angela had been there on her first day. She'd shown her the fire exits. She'd even shown her to the office on the day of her interview. But now it was over like it had never begun. With a condemned solemnity, Janet cleared her desk into a cardboard box she'd brought from home. And once she'd emptied her last drawer, there would be only a broken seat and brown finger stains on a beige keyboard to prove she'd ever been there at all. Angela thought of Janet often. She was a kind but quiet woman who had learned to keep herself to herself. In her younger days she'd been attractive in her own way, and Angela had always had the impression that she was the kind of woman who would have liked to have children but wasn't able. She had a propensity toward heavy knits and denim skirts, which didn't work together at all but the combination had become unmistakably hers over the years, and when Angela learned she was leaving, she walked over to her desk and asked where she got them from, the jeans and the wool. I've had them years, Angela, she said, her voice quiet, dry and trembling, like she held a moth in her throat. She had got them from a shop in Leeds many years ago. It was where she was from, where her parents still lived. She gave her the address, and when Angela took the train there the following Saturday, there they were, still hanging on the racks, like pieces of Janet. She bought two beige jumpers and a long denim skirt. At home she placed one jumper and the skirt in a cardboard box marked Janet 2014 on her bedroom floor and wrapped the second jumper in metallic red paper and a bow. And now this was it. Janet was leaving, and tonight there would be a meal to see her off. Another loss, another ghost in the office, another box in Angela's bedroom. Are you coming tonight, Angela? Veronica said over the box files. Yes, yes, I'm coming. What are you wearing? Black. So will I. I'll wear black. And what time? Um, say a quarter to eight. OK, see you there. Yes. See you there. She is home. It is 7.15pm. The birds have been fed and she shovels the day's crust from the plastic floor in the second bedroom and starts to get ready for the meal. She picks out the black dresses from a slanted wardrobe and throws them on the bed before her, where they lay there like sad, empty people. She critiques them all. Too wide, too short, too old. She picks one, the wide one, and drags it over herself. She lets it cover her face for a while and looks through the fabric and sequins at the room beyond. The boxes stacked around the bed shimmer through the fabric and glitter like a haphazard city. She thinks of Janet dying. Surely she would now. The cancer had come back twice already. She couldn't have long. Was she scared? Was she filled with regret? Or was she free finally? Would she just fly away between crystal towers on brilliant white wings? Angela pulls on the dress and a pair of purple heels, and the combination makes her look like a frog on stilts wearing a bag. She looks over at the boxes, now just boxes again, and feels the old ache return. She climbs up on a little plastic stool, taking a box marked Fiona 1987 from the stack. She lifts the hairnet from the top of the bundle of clothes and holds it to her face. It still smells of her. She arrives at the restaurant at 7.40pm and hears their laughter before she sees their faces. They are stood at the bar, all of them, 25 of the people she works with, their drinks two-thirds empty, their cheeks too flushed to have just arrived. They see her over the room and Veronica does her regal little wave 
beckoning Angela to her side. She makes her way over, through their shoulders and backs, to Veronica's side, the place where she is most comfortable. Veronica, I thought you said quarter to eight. Do you want a drink, Angela? Yes, I'll have a Bacardi and Coke, please, Veronica. Diet? Yes, Diet Coke, thank you. The room crackles and hums as workplace dynamics reorganise themselves through alcohol and repression into something vaguely dangerous. She sips sweet black tar through a pale pink straw and watches. Their laughter makes their eyes wide and their lips curl back. Angela sees white teeth and white eyes, fingers pointing here, there, everywhere. Jewels of sweat form beneath the sequins in the folds of her back, and she feels them coalesce and run in rivers down her canyons, tickling and shaming her till they soak into her tights. The smell of her own fear rises up, bitter and shameful, kissing her face as a sign shines in red above a fake door and tells her that it is not an exit. I need to visit the ladies, Veronica. Excuse me, can I get past? I said excuse me, please. I just need to... In the toilet cubicle, she hitches up her dress around her neck and dabs herself off as best she can with what tissue is left on the roll. It is too hot in here. She hates the heat. She hates it. The music from the bar rises and falls through the opening door as girls come and go, touching up and talking and peeing. Young, high voices, full of malice and life. What is that hair about? Laughter. 1988 called. It wants its dress back. More laughter. That could be about anybody. It could be about anybody. Dried off and rearranged, she's back in the bar which is almost empty now, apart from those couples out on a Wednesday night for whatever reason. A girl with kind eyes says, Are you with the party? From behind the bar. And she says yes and wants to cry. They're through there the girl says, and points round the corner to the dining area at the back of the building. Angela notes her name badge. Maria. Ah, yes, she can hear them again. Their voices come to her around the angle. Move it! I don't want her! Do you want her, Sheila? <laughs> Veronica, you have her! No! I have her all bloody day! Jeremy? Fuck off! <laughs> oh, Jeremy. No way. OK, fine. Put it here next to me. I'll have her again. <laughs> it takes effort for her to turn that dark corner, out of the relative peace of the bar area, with the quiet couples and downturned eyes, and into the unbridled electric maelstrom that boils just out of sight. She considers just going home but makes herself stay. Yes, it hurts here, but it would hurt at home too. And at least here the voices she hears aren't pre-recorded or in her head. She turns the corner and pretends to be looking in her bag as they pretend not to see her and tumble on with their rabble and rows. Janet, she says. Janet, I was in Leeds last week and got you this. I know you've got one, but... Oh, thank you, Angela. You didn't need to do that, but thank you. Not sure it'll be your size. Probably too small for you because you're quite swollen up these days, aren't you? The room goes quiet, betraying the fact that they are paying her no attention. You're here with me, Angela, says Veronica, saving the moment, and pointing down at a piece of folded card with her name written on it. It is stained with wine. No angel. I was twenty-three. I was working on the docks when he came to me. I had been given the job by a friend of my mother's who had pitied me enough to take me in after she died. She had found me destitute on the cobbles behind my mother's terraced house and lifted me up from my morosity with a kind condescension. To me she was a shimmer of ecclesiastic light cutting through the shadows with delicate authority. I had never seen anything like her, and I never would again. She died that night, 
in a sleep I helped her find. I had never been a strong man, I had never built or brawled, but I had my voice, and it was all mine. Too lilting for a man of substance, perhaps, but I was no man of substance. I would sing my aching song, and the birds would come from all around, and sit on the window sill and whistle along, my balsa wood bones reverberating with the pleasure I brought myself. Mother would say I had the voice of an angel, and then cry herself to sleep, stroking my jet black hair, her sharp nails tracing the scars on my scalp. You're weak, she said as I drifted away, weak like your father. And she was right. It was the fifties, and the newspapers sold me dappled monochrome images of palm trees and distant beaches, and I felt the cold north repel me. My dream had been to get to a beach in Spain before I lost the use of my legs, before I went the same way as my mother. Hereditary, they had said, and I knew it to be true. As I sat in the waiting area at her first appointment, I could already feel the ends of my fingers and toes dipping into the same static sea that eventually washed her away. I had to do something with the life I had left before I was just a broken twig of a man, bent up and salivating. So I took the job down by the black estuary. I worked hard and late with all the strength I had. I just needed to earn enough to take the ferry out into those wild curling waters, away from that isle of men like me, across the channel to where I could use what remained of the power beneath the tremor in my legs and the breath that shook in my lungs. I would busk and hitch until I saw those blue waves break on that yellow shore, and then maybe I would too. That was my only goal, to see the blue sea and let it take me, my reason to run, my reason to live a little longer. I had never wanted a daughter, nor a son, and I had certainly never before wanted to watch my own child grow in the stomach of her wretched mother, caged and screaming, but then one night, despite all that, there he was. I felt him before I saw him, a stab in the chest. Outside! Go outside! Go into the rain! The black sea curled and slapped the dock walls. I looked between the sheds for the man in my mind, and he was stood there, where I feared he'd be, shocking my marrow, blacker than the night, but darker than that even. He wore a coat of feathers, black feathers that seemed to reflect and remove the light all at once, and behind the feathers, the face, that face that burned me, burned my eyes and my soul and scorched the earth. He beckoned me over with an arthritic claw that clicked as it curled, and I stood in his presence for the first time. But I knew then that he had been in these shadows all along, ever since I was a little boy. He had seen me through my bedroom walls with those eyes, both red and black at the same time. Please know that I wanted him out of me. Every part of me wanted that. But the knowledge that he was a part of my life indistinguishable from my blood and shit, for now and for always, saturated me. I was, no, I had always been his. Yes, father, I said through the night that separated us and through the rain that streaked my face. He answered me in images. They flashed behind my eyes like epilepsy, taking my sight. The street, the girl, the deed, the cage, the knife the flames. That night I dreamed but didn't sleep. I saw him before my brain, behind my eyes, a suit of feathers, a hole in his face and that tongue. No man should ever have to see that tongue. Even inside of a dream no man should see that. It is enough to separate you from your sanity. And it did. In the end, it did. A bag of birds. It was Monday. It was always Monday. At lunch in the canteen, Angela overheard a conversation between two mothers, one saying how much she wanted to go to the south of France during the first week of August, and the other how she planned to go to the Algarve during the second, taking the children, 
flying away from this nameless northern town on stiff metal wings. Angela, dirty with jealousy, threw the crust of her sandwich in the bin, went down the corridor to the office with a heavy tread, and booked both, taking the two weeks for herself and taking the opportunity away from her colleagues. In the afternoon she listened to the two women talk about her. They had seen her name go up on the tired corkboard that hung above them and knew what she had done. She didn't care, but the air was thick with her crime. Eventually one of them said, So where are you going then? over the grey felt partition between her desk and theirs. Isle of Man, Angela said as she typed. The women complained about Angela for the rest of the day. She heard them remind each other just how rude she was, how terrible she looked, that lazy, crazy bitch. And when she went to bed that night, those words echoed around the warehouse of her bedroom, stacked high with boxes with women's names. The next day she woke to find that three little chaffinches had died, and one of the two magpies she had been keeping for good luck. She knelt on the plastic floor of the second bedroom and held their lifeless, flightless bodies to her chest. She cried for them, and then for herself. The dead magpie sat in her sweaty palm. Magpies were such beautiful creatures up close, more iridescent blue than black, like a nocturnal rainbow in a white night sky. She wasn't ready to let him go, she wanted to appreciate his beauty a little longer, but of course one magpie would only bring sorrow, so she placed the dead bird at her feet and walked over to the one still living, perched on the chest of drawers. Come on, she said quietly, and wrapped a stubby hand around its body, restricting its wings. The bird's head twitched this way and that, trying to get a look at its dead friend, who Angela collected from the floor. She held one in each fist and took them to the hallway, where the walls were lined with bird bodies and their alabaster bones. With a big hammer and a long nail, she pinned them both to a clear patch, somewhere between neat rows of starling skeletons and the big soggy owl she caught last summer and who had died on the previous Tuesday. She sat on the dirty carpet, her back to the wall, and watched as the wings of the living bird strobed black, blue, and white as they flapped furiously, then weakly as the last of its life drained out of the hole she made in its chest. Even in death she appreciated their beauty, and she looked forward to watching them rot and smear down the wall, leaving their delicate bones exposed, all white and beautiful. She stood up and regarded the mesh of bones and nails and broken bird, faded in patches from the bleach she sprayed at it when the house got warm and the smell became unbearable a high-contrast display of all the loss she had felt. She had known them all, and loved them in her own way, but now they were as hollow inside as she. She looked at them and her wall of death, and said, All beauty must die. Life was loss, and with the magpies gone, Angela knew she needed more things to lose. With resolve she went to the bedroom, and took a box marked Natalie 1998 from the piles that surrounded the place that she slept. She set it on the mattress, opened it, and pulled out the items bundled within. Laid out on her bed were the ingredients for someone else. A long curly red wig, a padded bra, brown jacket, and black boots. Natalie lay deflated on the dirty duvet. She had been a nurse at the gynaecologist. She wore a lot of makeup and had three children from two different men, and tonight, after work, an approximation of her would be taking a train to Chester to buy as many birds as she could fit in her big black bag. Last month it had been Sandra from the chemist, the month before, Kirsty from the tea rooms. In Chester, the grey day did its best to conceal her, but Natalie's red wig made it seem as though the shadows were bleeding, and she just couldn't escape the sideways glances and side street whispers. She went from pet shop to pet shop, buying the saddest-looking birds she could find, concealing herself in toilet stalls and wrapping their little bodies in tissue and elastic bands, before packing them tight in her big black bag. It was early evening, maybe 5.45pm, and the bag was full and she was tired. Sat under the heavy sky on damp grass that framed a dirty black church, she opened the bag and peered in at the little twitching bundles. You won't all make it. No, you won't. But it's not my fault, you see. 
You shouldn't have been in those cages in the first place. You should have flown away when you had the chance. You should have flown away. She rocked and flapped her imaginary wings, oblivious to the red wig that sat skewed on her head and to the stares of the crowd that had formed around her. She was at the train station. The sky had blackened and the free birds had fallen out of it. On the train home, she cried to a version of herself reflected in the glass. A little girl pulled away from her nervous parent and said, Are you okay, lady? Angela's wet eyes looked into the clean little soul speaking to her and managed to say, No, before the girl was tugged away. And they didn't, the birds. They didn't all make it. Time flies. Days and weeks passed, and Angela sat in the same three chairs. The one at home, the one at work, and the one on the train. And as the months ticked by, the air got warmer, and with the heat came the smell. She brought in the fans and fresheners, and kept the Velux in the second bedroom open a crack, but still she had to bleach the walls and disinfect the floor every day, just to keep the stench from filling her throat. It was work, but then wasn't everything. The two weeks off in August had felt so distant from February. Just a notional wisp in her mind, far, far away. She had only booked them to prove to those two women that she had things to do too, that she had people to see and places to be, a life to live. But the truth was she didn't. And now here they were on the horizon of her life, like an exit through which the scant few people forced into it by shared employment were queuing up to leave. The prospect of so much empty time began to hollow her out. She could hear the call of an owl echo inside herself. It asked, Who? 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 She tried to hold it back, tried to go back on her idea to take the two weeks off, but she was too damn proud when the people were there. Too proud, too afraid, and so lonely. She cries in the bathroom and the clock says 2.47pm, but the hands keep spinning and time slides like water on glass. Then it's June and the TV plays between the days and the birds don't sing and she never sleeps. And then it's July and she cries at night and catches more birds because so many have died. And when the sun goes down she wears red wigs and in the twilight she could be anyone. And then it's August. He's here. On the night before the last day, Angela almost wakes into a thousand nightmares. The red LED alarm clock blinks 0317 through the silver darkness, and she has a feeling she's not alone. Is there someone here? Yes, she thinks. Yes, there is. She thinks she sees a shape of something dark stood at the foot of the bed, easily six foot tall. Something with wings. Is that the red light from the alarm clock reflected in its nightmare eyes? Panic clasps her chest closed and paints images behind her eyelids. In her sleep, she grips the mattress with bleached fists. Just wait, Angela. You have to wait until he's finished. Don't struggle. Remember. You were always so good at this. I try to say this to her from the bottom of this terrible place, through the bars of my abstract prison. I feel her pain, all of it. It is deeper than the sea. She goes limp on the bed. Could she hear me? Could she hear me all this time? And then I am with her. I am in the bed with her again, invisible in the pale blue light. The moon sees the three of us between the curtains and gives the phantom bird a silver stripe until he opens his wings wide and blots it out. And then, in the shadow of his own wings, God loves his children. Then it's the last day and she works and leaves and no one says hello and no one says goodbye. Leave. Angela wakes on the first day of her two-week leave, 
with dread sitting on her chest and time hollow all around her. She drags herself out of that grubby bed, more through habit than desire, the summer heat close and cloying, her sweat coating her like cling film. She eats a breakfast she doesn't remember, then turns on the TV, the radio and the washing machine. Their sounds combine into something approaching company, and she sits in the garden and imagines there are people inside the house. For the first few days, she filled the light times with television and the dark ones with her own gentle touch. Both helped her sleep, and she did here and there. She dressed as the women in her boxes and talked to a mirror about the things they had done and the ways they had been loved. She put birds in her hair and learned their songs. Sometimes she was Veronica, in a black sequined gown. She hated how pathetic she was, that girl she kissed in the glass, a messy amalgam of a beauty lost by decades. For hours she stared into that mirror of lipstick, just dust and shadow beyond, a self-portrait of her loneliness. Many aching hours passed. Stop crying, you silly bitch, Angela said into an hour far, far away slapping herself across the face with a full hand. It stung, and her ear rang out like a bell, so she did it again, and again, and again, until one side of her face laughed, while the other still cried. Day became night, became the oily sea, and her sanity slipped beneath the surface. Panic filled her lungs, testing their strength, dragging her down. Her mind thrashed in the riptide, trying to find land, trying to find something to hold on to. Where was she? Where was up and where was down? Was she east or was she west? She could have been nowhere or everywhere. A map. She needed a map. And one night she found one, between her boxes and her birds. A map of the Isle of Man she took from me as a child. It anchored her in space and time, her eyes eating it like it was a cake with a key inside like it could show her a hidden way home. But she trembled at its impermanence. What if she lost it? What then? She might find herself so adrift that she would never see anyone ever again. She would copy it, she thought, somewhere she couldn't lose it, somewhere she would always see. She scrambled through her fading kitchen, taking a knife from the drawer, and began to scratch out a scaled drawing of the island on her kitchen wall. It started accurately enough but by the end of the third day her blistered hands were wet with sweat and too much of her sense had ebbed away. She marked places on an imaginary cove with words such as the dark place and this is where they hurt me. Over the final twelve hours the Isle of Man became much, much more. It became so much more that it was necessary for Angela to extend it up onto the ceiling. Standing on a squat three-step ladder to reach, and craning her short, wide neck back at perilous right angles to her square body. And when the fluorescent strip light blocked the progress of the detailed drawing of the island in her mind, she decided it had to be removed, tearing it from its housing with a wrench of her claw hammer. Awake so long and so abandoned on her distant island, she had lost the sense to know that the bulb was still burning, and as her hammer destroyed her light, she was showered in glass and sparks and darkness flooded in to fill the space the light left behind. Contrast brought her home. In the dim living room light that made it through the door, she looked around at her fractured kitchen with new eyes. This was the edge of her sanity. She had walked up closer to that ragged ridge than she ever had before, and dared to peer over at the limitless black sea that looked back, and told her only that there was so much further to fall. The following night she woke from her sleep choking on the sheets bunched up in her mouth as one part of her tried to kill another. She pulled the fabric out of her in ribbons of spit and ran out into the street where there was nobody else and shouted, Please! I can't take this! I can't take all this loneliness! But no one heard her. No one listened. The identical houses lining the street kept their windows closed and their mouths shut so she went back inside and sat by the phone. She gripped the armchair until the sun rose and the phone lines opened at work, and when they did, she packed her nose with tissue and called and called and complained in different voices about insurances she didn't have.
She complained about policies and prices and her polycystic problems until her throat was dry and her eyes rolled back in her head. Put me through to your manager. Put me through. Her colleagues feigned the support she never had in life. And eventually she fell asleep listening to them speak, holding their voices to her face, feeling their vibrations against her cheek. Hello? Are you there? You're through to Veronica. Can I help you? The Rook It was the day before her leave left her, and when she slept she dreamed of a shaking cage around a beating black heart. The summer sun found her through the curtains, and she woke with a picture behind her eyes of the Larsen trap she set on the shelf in the dark of the trees. He was here. He had returned to her. Dressed light in the deep blue morning, she tiptoed with as much grace as her inelegant frame allowed through shrub and thicket to the secret place she would run to from her uncle's, the place that she now found her cage rattling with an inhabitant. The cage held a little black rook, no older than a few weeks, his wings still so meagre that Angela thought it was a wonder he had made it in there at all. His head swivelled to the side so he could regard her better, and she had a strange feeling that she was late. And what was this? Behind the little rook was the jerking remains of another, bigger bird, plucked and boned almost to death, but not quite. The rook's black eye caught hers, and then looked nowhere. She knew what he'd done, but he'd only done what he must to survive, hadn't he? The dying bird was so big, and he was just an infant. He had been defending himself, surely. The rook sat and waited as the life left the bird at his back, and Angela didn't even put on her handling gloves. She just opened the door and he ducked under the lifted gate, took a slow, deliberate step out onto her hand and gripped her finger tight. She looked down into those black diamonds in his head and saw herself in so many ways. Angela opened her jacket and fed him into the warm place between the light beige lining and her big low breast. He didn't flinch. He just gripped the fabric with his little black claws and held still. On the way home, he pecked at her soft skin till she bled out onto his oily black feathers, and she gripped the sleeve of her jacket and let him. On their first night together, an unseasonable wind picked up and shook the house. The tiles rattled on the roof and in the garden the fence panels fought their cases to fly away. Inside the second bedroom, the light flickered and the birds flapped and panicked, their beady eyes spinning and wide and their beaks drawn open, showing off strange little tongs that poked at the air. Every one but the rook. The rook just sat under the sloping eaves of the rattling house on a stack of old books, with the same stillness he had in the rattling cage. He let his eyes reflect his new home with ambivalence. Was it ambivalence? Angela regarded him from behind the mesh door and lace curtain that hung over it, making the scene a mosaic. She felt the change. She wanted to go in and feel the soft wind from their little wings as they flew around her and landed on her shoulders and nestled in her hair. She wanted to smile as she fed them from her hands. But not this night. Not any more. The room was his now, and when she closed her eyes to sleep it was as though she was at sea. She could feel the spray on her cheeks and the salt on her lips. She felt herself corroding, but a light pulsed to the right of her vision like a lighthouse. She was almost there. Office Hours she wakes to find herself naked on the beige bed linen. Warm yellow light cuts under the blue curtain, and to her bleary eyes it's a shore. She's washed up. She's home. She looks through the crust in her eyes at the tall pile of neat washing. Work outfits, cleaned and pressed dutifully, call to her like a beacon. She wears them enthusiastically, and leaves the dankness of her home for the fluorescence of work with a spring in her stomp, the hint of a smile at the corner of her lips, and a cold sore. 
She boards the train and finds her seat, and overhead the cuckoos flying south scrawl a V in the sky. At work, Veronica asks how she's been, and she's too happy to see her face and hear her voice to answer the question honestly. She's been great, she says. Great. Got a lot done. Veronica asks if she enjoyed the Isle of Man with the ghost of a smile on her lips. Yes, thank you, Angela says, thinking of the imaginary isle that has swallowed her kitchen. I saw a lot of wonderful things. Then she is swept away by a calming tidal wave of paperwork that cleanses her soul of that dirty black bird who filthies her mind and heart and second bedroom. Beyond the dusty office window, a charm of finches spiral through blue sky. She feels the salvation, and it tastes like honey on her lips, like a salve on her soul. But then it's the late afternoon, and the phone won't stop ringing, and Veronica won't look her way. Then the sore on her lips begins to sting, and she feels his damp decay creep back in, tickling up her veins, fluttering and flaking, nerves stuttering on and off like a dying light. She holds the arms of the chair with hands that buzz with a static that seems to interfere with the picture on her screen, which smears in front of her an electric mess of blue and black. She feels him swarm through her brain, turning parts of her off, turning parts of her on, and she wants to touch herself and she wants to scream, but she doesn't. Her lips tremble, but she doesn't scream, but the people look over at her anyway, their faces full of holes and she is lost again at the bottom of the deep black sea. The week draws on, Tuesday becoming Wednesday, becoming Friday, and sleep, Angela's oblivious mistress, leaves her aching in the dark, with only the memory of her embrace, and the taste of her beautiful oblivion on dry, angry lips. In the night, he calls to her. He pecks out a message on the floorboards, and she lies trembling in his pervasive presence, trying to decode his Morse code. And on the third night, she thinks she does. It seems to say, B, U, R, D, G, U, R, L, Bird Girl. Secrets and Lies It was two in the afternoon when she realised something was wrong. Lunchtime had finished, and the familiar clackety-clack of keys being tapped resumed after its brief reprise the same way it always did. It was a day like any other. All these days were the same. So when Veronica didn't come back to her desk at 1.58pm exactly, as she always, always did, Angela knew that something was amiss. An electric dread crept through her bones. Was she dead? Had her hip given way on the metal steps that lead up from the car park? Was she now lying prone in the spiked shrubs, helpless? What if Angela discovered her there, so in need? She'd be so grateful to see her. So beautiful and vulnerable and indebted. Angela could save her, lift her up in her short wide arms and carry her home, where she could undress her and nurse and nurture her. Of course she would have to silence the birds and move the boxes from the bedroom, and she'd certainly have to take the bones off the walls, but she could always cover her head to get her upstairs, and she could keep her unconscious if she had to. At seven minutes past one, Angela could take no more. She called Veronica's mobile. Tap, 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 tap. It was ringing. No one answered but Angela noticed that the arm of her boss's chair was vibrating. Her jacket was still on the back of it. So had she not gone into town? She said she was going into town. It was cold outside. She wouldn't go without a jacket. Angela checked the pockets of the little black jacket, and sure enough, there were her car keys, a hairband, and her phone. She was in the building. Angela flicked through Veronica's year planner where it lay on her desk. The space between one and two o'clock had been coloured in with a red pen. Something was going on. Someone was hiding something. Someone was lying. The office had been built in the 80s during the boom, and the company had expanded with all the gluttony of the period. And when the sequins and shoulder pads and cocaine hangovers faded, so did the revenue. 
leaving vast swathes of the building, empty caverns of faded commercial endeavour. There were three unused floors in the building, one above and two below. Angela knew them all. In fact, she'd worked in most of them over the years, and further to that, she still had the keys. Downstairs, said a voice in her head. She made her way down the back stairs that led into the corner of the building where HR had once existed, before process had bitten off its own tail and they had outsourced themselves. She got out the keys and unlocked the door as quietly as possible. She shouldn't be here. She knew it right away. The air down here was different. It was still and cold and sorry somehow. The blinds were down as they always were and through them the afternoon sun drew parallel lines over rows of empty filing cabinets. Angela crept between the banks of desks, trying not to disturb the air but failing, motes spinning around her, stars around her barren planet. Silence. There was no one here, just Angela and the flecked dead skin of old employees. She had been wrong, there were no secrets here. Just dead dreams, dust bunnies and abandoned venture. She went back over to the stairwell and let her daydream die too. She'd found nobody so many times. She berated herself for having hope when there was no hope to have. She had been a stupid little girl. Stupid girl. Stupid, stupid girl. But wait. What was that? Was there a sound coming from the disused bathroom past the old meeting room? Yes, yes there was. It sounded like carpet being scrubbed. Was it the cleaner? On a Wednesday? Why would they clean an unused toilet in the dark? She moved back through the room, stomping now, swirling the air, more curious than afraid. The sound got louder as she turned the corner, turning her wide back to the striped sunlight and looking down into the area outside the men's toilet, where natural light did not reach and no artificial ones were lit. On the far wall was the door to the toilet. It was open a little, and yes, inside there was movement. Beige shapes moved in the dark, and Angela knew that perfume. She didn't recognise the salty note that came with it, but she recognised the huffing and the friction. It had been a long time, but she still recognised it, so out of place in here, in this beige box of bureaucracy. Angela adjusted the blind just a little, and one of those stripes of light crawled along the floor and up a foot and onto the exposed naked backside of the person she was hoping to save, of the boss she was hoping to hold, of the friend she dreamed she could love. She stood transfixed, her senses open like a broken tap, frigid information gushing all over her, slapping her face with a frost-bitten hand, filling her with fire and ice. There it was, the thing she didn't know she never wanted to see. An image of Veronica, getting ruined on all fours by a hunched man with knuckled hands. A pale white devil made of cartilage and lust, rapacious and carnivorous, devouring her love from back to front. Angela baited her breath, then turned and left the scene of their crime as gracefully as she was able, her immediate grief an infinite empty universe. She walked up the stairs, then out of the front door, away from the office and the questioning eyes and down the tall, dark alley behind the building. She crouched between the refuse and brick and pressed her nails into the palms of her hands as hard as she could, letting the tears that fell from her chin and the blood that dripped from her fists bloom in the dirty brown puddle at her feet. She had never seen love, but she knew that what she saw in their darkness was not even an approximation. She could love her so perfectly. Veronica, you are better than that cold toilet floor. How could you let yourself be degraded like that? If it was degradation Veronica desired, then Angela could give her that. Yes, she could degrade her in many, many ways. And what about her? What about Angela? If she had never even had the privilege of being handled roughly in a disused toilet, then how far was she from love? The gulf was so great it spanned the ages and her heart sunk to a new, deeper fathom, the lowest yet. A seagull dropped out of the heavens so far above her onto the black plastic sack of shit to her left. 
She regarded him through the shattered windscreens of her eyes. She had never liked seagulls. Dumb, squawking, awkward creatures. In fact, she hated them. She realized now that she always had. Her little eyes glinted once, then she leapt out of her squat shadow, grabbed him by the neck, and with her own torn hands, shredded him in a frenzy of bird and blood. His open throat made a noise never more. She found herself at home, in dull grey feathers and red. Sat at the kitchen table, she listened to the phone ring ring, and the birds upstairs beat their wings and sing a panicked song. By the evening, the phone had stopped, and the blood had dried, and she remembered herself and her situation. Oh yes, I was supposed to carry on working, wasn't I? Oh yes, yes I was. It was probably work on the phone. It was probably her. The world outside her window went black. Angela pressed herself up from the stand chair and on a weary frame staggered across the kitchen to the drawers. She opened the second drawer down and pushed aside all the tiny pale bones and directed her clawed hand toward the candle she knew was there. Taking the matches from the windowsill behind the sink, she lit it, and in its tiny sphere of warmth she stripped down and cleaned the grimy blood from that dirty seagull off her hands and face. The light flickered over her naked body which wavered like a broken table as she prepared her clothes for the inquisition she knew she would face the following day. And as the candle faded, so did she, and she slept the sleep of the damned there on the torn linoleum floor. An angel. I knew her name before I saw her face. Even in the darkness he brought into my life, I could see it burning. I could see it when I closed my eyes, indelible, like it was the only light I had ever seen. The name he chose for her. Angel. An angel. Angela. A joke, surely. His laughter echoes through the cruelty, through the ages, that awful guttural squawk. She would be no angel. She would never be an angel, coming from where she did. From such atrocities. How could she ever hope to ascend? No, she would endure the same slow slide underground that I did, and my mother before me. How far back did it go, this curse? Who had let him into our blood? I'll never know. He keeps me alone down here. But when I breathe, when I breathed, I felt not blood in my veins, but his dark flock. Let it end. Let it end with her. She is suspended. A new day. She was up with the birds and saw the first light through the branches of the dead tree that forked out of the front lawn. Her sleep had been short but thorough, and she had woken with a rare resolve and a new realisation. The boss that would be so mad when she got into work had no power anymore. She had left it all over that dirty little bathroom floor, and when she whisked Angela off to the meeting room, for what would no doubt be a disciplinary meeting regarding her sudden and unexpected absence on the previous day, Angela would drop her bomb and a new order would begin. One in which the Formica tables had turned, and one in which Angela would finally, finally have the upper hand. She arrived at 8.17am, and she was first, as always. She made up her desk, returning the incomplete reports she had abandoned the previous day to the pending file, then sat with her coffee and a crooked smile, and waited for the game to begin. Here came Veronica, walking stiffly into the room, her coat pulled tight around her and her bag held closely to her body. The coat was new, Angela noted. Where did she get it? Was it from Mark's? Angela let herself picture Veronica on that bathroom floor, glistening and shameful. It was no wonder she walked funny, Angela thought, and bile rose in her throat, acrid and astringent. Morning, Angela said 
But Veronica just removed her coat and bag and walked away from her desk in that clipped, nervous manner that Angela had seen so many times leading up to the termination of someone or other. Her belly flipped at the prospect, but she settled herself with the knowledge that she had the upper hand here. She would only have to hint at what she had seen in that dusty department downstairs, and Veronica would be as helpless as a bird in a cage. She loved her family so much. Angela had listened to it so many times. They were her world. He was her rock. The boy, her little soldier. She would do anything to keep them. Anything. The others had begun filing in. One after the other they walked by, their eyes flicking over her, wondering what happened yesterday. Bored, hungry minds picking over carrion for scraps. Can I see you in the office, please? came Veronica's voice from behind her. This was it. She stood up and followed the aged harlot to the cold back office, where she would take one more telling off, then get everything she'd ever wanted. She tingled in a V-shape, down into a point at the bottom of herself. On the long walk to the back of the building, time stretched away from her, like a wave retreating from shore. Angela planned her attack. She would let Veronica do her spiel, list all the things she had done wrong, and then, when she passed her the document to sign, just before her ink stained the paper, Angela would ask Veronica if she enjoyed her new position in HR yesterday. Angela grinned her thin grin and realised she was salivating. She wiped her chin. The door swung open and what she saw hit her across her ruddy face. Rather than the cosy little scenario Angela had pictured in her mind, she was presented with a committee. Senior managers all in a row, each with an identical piece of paper, and with their faces twisted into expressions of concern with varying degrees of success. Please take a seat, Miss Hanrahan. It is, Miss, isn't it? What was this? This wasn't what she usually... Angela, said the one wearing the most convincing mask. How are you today? Fine, said Angela trying to find her feet on shifting sands. Good, that's good to hear, replied the suit. His eyes narrowed into a smile for a child. We take the well-being of the staff very seriously, as you know, especially those that have been with us as long as you have. He nodded. She nodded. What else could she do? But we have some concerns, Angela. Concerns about your conduct and your reliability. Does that come as a surprise to you? Angela blinked and shook her head, because it didn't, but... Can we talk about yesterday? said Nicola from finance. What was she doing here? Why would... Angela, after lunch you were seen coming back into the office, and you sat for a while at your seat like everyone else. But according to reports from your colleagues, you appeared to suddenly become angry. It says here... Her eyes flicked over a stack of shuffled papers. That you banged your hands on your desk and were heard swearing to yourself. Can you explain what the matter was? No, I didn't, said Angela, her wide white forehead gridded with lines and beaded with sweat as her mind showed her pictures. Maybe she did hit the desk, but... I was just wondering where she was, Angela said pointing a crooked finger at the woman that had deceived and abandoned her in ways she couldn't face. She was late, and I was worried. But she couldn't go on. To say more would be to expose her secret and sacrifice the only thing she had left. If she said those words to these people, they would lose their power, and despite her predicament, that power was still the only thing she cared about. Why should you be worried where Veronica is? What concern is it of yours? said a suit, with a man in it that Angela didn't recognise. Who was he? Was he from another site? Well, I just wondered, and... You just wondered where your line manager was, and you thought you'd leave work for the day, said the man, all air quotes and cocked brows. Angela, this is most concerning. As far as we can tell, you came back from a perfectly normal morning at work, flew into a rage for no discernible reason, then left the building, leaving your jacket and handbag, 
and then didn't answer our phone calls or the door when Veronica called at your home after work. What? she said. She didn't come to my house. Yes, I did, said Veronica meekly and without meeting her gaze. At 6.15. I knocked and knocked and you didn't answer. I could see the TV on. She was lying and both women knew it. Angela hadn't had the TV on. Veronica was hedging her bets. She must have been with him again, that angry white devil. Defiled twice in one day. My God, she was a filthy little bitch, she thought. Filthier than Angela had dared dream. No! said Angela, shouting now, unsure where to start, unsure how to defend herself. I was... I was sick and I... I hadn't slept well. I don't sleep well. The birds keep me up and... I'm on my own, you see. Angela, calm down, please, he said, and all their eyes sang along, birds on a wire. It's not just yesterday, is it? This is the second time in two weeks that you've left early without explanation. And quite aside from these unauthorised absences, we've had growing concerns about your conduct for a while now, documented here in your private meetings with Veronica, who, by all accounts, has really struggled with you, Angela. Bitch. I'm afraid we really have no choice but to suspend you for a period of six weeks to allow you time to rest. Angela could feel herself start to ice over. No. No, she couldn't be alone for six weeks. No, please, she started. But they just looked down at their papers. And furthermore, we must demand that you do not make contact with the office, nor your colleagues during this period, even if you are pretending to be someone else. Veronica caught a snigger in her throat and busied herself scribbling. Okay. OK, Angela saw what was happening. She dropped her defence and let her face hang loosely from her soft bones. She signed a paper with an angry spike, turned on a callous heel, and left the room. She took her bags and jackets from the silent office, then left the place as laughter began to build like a tidal wave behind her. Angela sat at home in a kind of terrible waking dream with an image in her mind's eye of her desk and her phone and her workstation at the bottom of a black and white pit. She brought in an old office chair from the garage and sat at the kitchen table and tapped at imaginary keys with variable degrees of accuracy. And despite her best efforts, her thoughts drifted upstairs to the rook in the second bedroom. He had grown so big so quickly, and the larger he got, the darker his greasy wings became until it seemed like there was no light left, and the birds that he didn't kill spoke of nothing, but their empty eyes said they had no more hope to lose. She is eight. There is nowhere else for her to go because I left her so alone, so she lives with her uncles. My brothers, twins, they were all that was left. They never married. They had our father's eyes and his fists. They call her Bird Girl because of her strange little nose, turned down and sharp like a beak. She didn't ask for that beak, but she had it. Her mother had it too, but I could never tell her that. I never spoke of that woman, because some secrets are to be whispered. Like these I am whispering to you, and some are for the void, never to be spoken even in our final moments. Even at the end of everything, I would never say those things. From the Hedgerow The darkness rolled over her, and she hid in it. The birds in her brain sang their maddening song, and as the last lights blinked out in the street she lived on, Angela grabbed her black mac and wrapped in plastic, made for the night. She zigged and zagged over puddle and cobble, and they reflected her back as she stamped on her own warped image. And by two in the morning, she was out of town and at the bottom of the winding lane that led up to Veronica's house. Even from the bottom of the lane, she could see that one downstairs light remained on, the kitchen light. The same kitchen Angela heard so much about every day at work. 
The kitchen where this woman played out what Angela now knew was just pretense of perfect domesticity. Button the shirt, glaze the pastry, pretend to be happy. Fool us all, you bitch. Well now, here they were, with one comfortable in her shadows and the other exposed in her prison. The light came through the bushes into Angela's little black eyes, which darted around the scene. She was looking for something, hints or clues to this dirty hidden life that both fascinated and appalled her. And she missed her company, the scent of petals that emanated from her. She wanted more of her, more secrets, more power, a reason to end it. And there she was in her shabby pink dressing gown, sat half on a tall breakfast bar stool, taking big glugs from a glass of pink wine and propping her rose-tinted glasses on the end of her nose, tapping out texts, all fingers and thumbs. No prizes for guessing to whom, Angela thought, and gagged. It was late now, maybe 2.30 a.m., and she was moving. She was leaving the house, still in her dressing gown, too. What kind of madness was this? What kind of maniac goes out at this time? Angela questioned, wiping tears from her eyes. An engine purred up Veronica's lane, and Angela began to understand. It died in the night, and two shadows met on the black lane, then went together through a hedge and up over a field into the deep blue night. Angela knew only too well the scene that would play out over that copse, and she had no desire to see that again. She had stolen enough secrets. She made her way from another agony, past the dark blue Mondeo that had arrived while she squatted in the bushes. The car window was open, and the air moved toward her, bringing with it the smell of men, of leather and diesel and sweat. She stuck her arm in and tugged the handbrake sharply up and down. The hunk of steel lurched backwards a little, moving slowly at first, but getting faster and faster, churning up gravel and verge. She took the next left and walked back towards town, and as she did, she heard the car tear through the bushes and drop down the embankment, crashing into the river, metal and glass meeting rock and water, elements fighting in the night. The sound wrapped itself around her, and she smiled, for the first time in weeks. A plan began to form in her mind. Yes, said the rook in her head. Yes. It burns like autumn. Autumn encroaches into her vision. Cell by cell the world around her starts to die and she finds comfort in it. Summer vibrates at too high a frequency for her. It is too unstable, too unpredictable, all that heat and light. She is better surrounded by its charred remains. She was born in them after all, on this day, in a graveyard, in autumn. She takes a walk through it, through the death, through the decay. The leaves burn in the trees, then flake away, falling in spirals, giving shape to the wind, leaving their branches alone and complex and beautiful. Skeletons. Varicous veins. She stops on an overpass and leans over the barrier, looking down. She can feel the sky at her back, feels like the end is near, and it is. A crow sits on the power lines that slice across the sky with something squirming in its beak. It drops an infant rabbit on the tarmac. Cars zip over the body, crushing its bones and oozing its purple tubes out of it, onto and into that nasty black highway. The bird jerks its head left and right, then hops down off the bridge and into the open entrails, picking and eating the spoils between all that metal danger. I remember her birth in that burning ring of fire. The chanting... The awful chanting rang through me for years. Whenever it was dark, it was there. I only had to close my eyes. I knew not the words, but the intention was only too clear. In the end, I jumped from a bridge to stop that evil hum. And yes, the sticks and stones hurt her mother. I saw the wounds and welts as they formed on her pregnant belly. 
but none hurt so much as those words forged in fire and ungodly ritual. I can still hear them now, the way they cut her out, held her up to his face. No father should... I can't breathe. I can't breathe. No father should let that happen. I see him. I see him through the back of my head. He's behind me. Oh, Lord, he's behind me. My God, it's so dark here. My God! Threadbare. Time blows through us, leaves us threadbare. It echoes across the cracked earth, a god and a monster, a prison and a desert. Three, six, nine, twelve. All those wasted moments thrown into that booming black hole, a black eye wide in the dark. Loneliness replicates, creating more of itself, a reflected solitude birthing cogs and numbers. Her hands spin backwards. She's aching and creaking, then she breaks. The sands blow out of her shattered hourglass. She mixes it with the saline that streams from her face, kneading and fisting with broken arms. Chemicals react, a structure forms, a church. The heat of her wasted love cracks its fine walls and screams at me across the plains of this other place, and I reverberate forever in its stinging wind. Now you are nowhere in a cathedral of your own loneliness. The wind carries your song to me over time's scorched, veined terrain. And yes, it reminds me of you. But more than anything, it reminds me of me. A version of me. A terrible version of me. And though no one else ever did, and though it's too late to save either of us now, for all it's worth, I loved you, Angela. Let us pray. Suspended in time, Angela's life became a spiral, a curling downward movement that forced the blood away from her brain and loosened the ties that bound her, setting her adrift. She had never had company, but she had never been this alone. She missed Veronica and work in sleep's blind embrace, and the time and solitude they left behind ate into each other, becoming an echoing cathedral, a place to worship my legacy and the madness I left her. Beyond the voile curtain that webbed the front window, the lights in the houses that lined her street blinked out one by one. Then, once the last had been extinguished, Angela rid herself of her clothes and went outside into the night down to the bottom of the garden to the dirty earth beneath the big tree. She fell onto her knees and took it into her hands, smearing and pressing into herself the very earth she came from. The stars above winked while the moon looked away, and when she went back inside she was wild-eyed and alive and infused with the power of the negative light. In the second bedroom she pulled the door shut and fell once more to her knees. The big black bird bounced from foot to foot, ducking and weaving his head. His dark wings taking so much light from the room, Angela could barely tell if he was there at all. Which one? she asked, and waited for an answer that never came. She would have to choose for herself. She got to her feet, pushing herself up on fat white knees clad in earth, and went over to the birds she tried to love in the daylight all huddled together in the corner of the room, amongst piles of the most sapphic woman's own from the 1980s. With hungry wide eyes and a clawed white hand, she plucked a brown sparrow from the flock. Is this what you want? she shouted at the rook. He didn't blink. Is this? she tailed off, shaking. She looked in his little sparrow eyes. There was a universe in there. She chewed the head off the little brown bird, who offered only the smallest bit of resistance as her teeth separated his tiny vertebrae. The air became a frenzy of beak and bird. 
Wings flapped and claws clawed and blood dribbled gently down Angela's hand. She knelt again before her dark black master and painted red circles and lines on her low belly with the stump of its neck, thrashing her head and thrusting her hips, her blood pumping her dirty urges, chanting words from another place into a billow of down and dust. Feathers flew and sparrows shrieked and Angela lay back on the clay-white floor and put her fingers inside her wrinkled wetness. She opened herself and picked a floating plume out of the air, then stroked it over her tender swelling beneath the cloud of chaos storming above her, the black rook calm in its eye. Tell me, tell me you want me, say it. I want you, he said. No, say it in her voice. I want you, Veronica said through a black bird's beak. Angela's legs bucked, rigid and restless, and her body racked until it could rack no more. Then she seized, then fell still, fevered, clammy, and spent. A thick energy filled the room, coming out of her, filling the room that smelled of sulphur and the sea. What had she done? What had she conjured? What had she asked of him? Her blood pooled cold and she held herself in panic and regret. The birds fell silent and lined up all in a row. Their feathers still hung in the air, but the room was pregnant with expectation. Then it began to shake, the air tight with a terror from beyond this place, and it brought with it a sound, a distant friction like knives being sharpened in a chasm. Louder and louder it got until the sound became like a band around her head, getting tighter and tighter until she squealed like a pig on a spit. Her scream fought the air and forced the feathers out of it, salt peter to their bullets of lead. Bam! 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 They hit the plastic-covered boards hard and heavy with a furious pelt, and she covered her face, protecting herself from the buckshot, while sixty-six little beaked heads looked away from her where she lay, naked and addled and in the grime of her crimes. The last feather hit the ground with a splintering crack and at once the birds stiffened as if stricken with the same rigours that had seized her only moments before. Their heads turned toward her, cracking and clicking like a terrible ratchet, until their beady little eyes were all trained on her, all one hundred and thirty-two. Then their beaks began to open in perfect synchronicity, but they opened too wide, far too wide, so wide she could hear fine sinews separating, coming away from keratin and cartilage, mandible tearing from mandible until they were all screaming the same silent scream. Then a whistling began again, emanating from their awful yawns, like the wind between the eaves, and with it came a voice from the other place. It said, I will show you what I want. And with one loud crack, every one of their precious bird necks snapped into a right angle the wrong angle, and they fell to the floor for the last time, broken and lifeless. She crawled through their dead bodies, out of the room, pathetic and sobbing, cursed and cursing, and pulled the screen door closed. At 4.30 a.m. she fell asleep on the worn hallway floor, the carpet wet with her own regret. She woke when she heard the alarm rising from the adjacent bedroom and pushed herself up into a seated position. She looked down at her badly daubed body art, now dry and brown, and then back at the second bedroom. The rook was stood on the floor at the other side of the screen door. He had watched her sleep. There is a man at the door. Knock, knock. There is a man at the door. She can see him from where she still lays naked on the floor between the first and second bedrooms. She can see his shape through the textured glass, wide and tall and motionless. Go downstairs, says the rook in her mind. So she does. And she holds her hands over her breasts and the dark triangle beneath her painted belly. Open the door, the blackbird says. 
and through the glass the man at the door seems to grow wider and taller. She sees his fists swinging by his wide thighs, and her head begins to shake. No, no, I won't, she says. But I brought him here for you, he replies. Love him. This is what I want. No, no, I can't. Please don't make me, she says into her hands. She can feel the intentions of the man at the door, boring through the glass, penetrating her flesh, trained on the circle she painted in blood on her belly. Take him into you. Take his seed. This is what I want. No, not that, she screams. Anything but that. He shrieks a response she can't decipher, and it peels the paper from the walls and the man knocks again. Knock. 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 The swirling carpet seems to undulate beneath her feet, and she runs from the door to the kitchen, throwing herself back against the wall, sobbing and fearful, and the cups rattle on their hooks. Then there it is again, the knocking that seems to come from the walls now, from the earth, insistent and furious. Knock. 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 And with each quaking knock her world burns and the white light dims until there is none left and the world rots black on red. The mirror on the wall rattles and through it she can see the man at the door, still cutting the same square silhouette, but now from a blood-red sky. Love him! The words tune through her bones, vibrating her till her lips tingle and her fingernails feel as though they might come loose from their pale pink beds. She thrashes through her kitchen and opens the door of the cupboard beneath the sink with singing fingers, dragging out bottles and brushes and before forcing herself into it, bending herself into its tiny space like a dog broken into a suitcase. She pulls the door closed and holds it shut with nails that bend back then break off. He sucks the light from her eyes, punishing her for her insolence. Blood pours into her vision. Somehow she can see it growing like red trees through her mind. They needle into her brain and she falls into the shrieking black pit he opens in her soul. Terror consumes her, pure, endless. She opens her mouth to scream, but it is not her scream that comes from her constricted throat but his caustic call. It clamps open her jaw and tears through her throat. She covers her mouth, revolted at the sound that echoes out of her, but her hands scratch her face. She feels one with the other and they clash together in a way that sickens her. They are not her hands at all. They are claws, hard and sharp. Her stomach bubbles with disgust and she gags and coughs, but her windpipe is filled with something. Feathers. They fill her throat and pack her sinuses and line her mouth. Spitting and thrusting, she convulses as her body tries to expel him, her whole being thundering with revulsion. She hits out at the walls of the cupboard, fighting the present moment with everything she has, as though she can tear her way out of his grip with these new hands and her hate and her fear. But the terrible shaking only builds and builds and she has no choice but to scream his scream and hold on with those angry claws. And she knows that she must open herself up to him, let the man and the bird into her sacred places, let them fill her up with that black swarm. Take me then, take me, she says. But she says it in her mind because her mouth is already full of him. In the darkness of the cupboard beneath the sink she sees nothing, but the air seems to swell at her surrender and the walls become turgid flesh, pulsing and hot. Her knees hit the walls of fevered flesh as her legs are forced apart and she feels the air move fast and fluid as a dry bracken wind blows between them and into her, pumping, belching, filling her up, testing her extremities testing her seams until she is filled with a plasticine width, and her eyes bulge forth from her face, threatening to burst, threatening to leave her blind and hysterical with only her aching, stinging sockets filled with their relative void as proof they were ever there at all. She wants to push them back, into her head, but with these claws they will surely pop like balloons. 
and the walls sweat salty and bristle with wire and swell until there is no room left between her and the cupboard at all. And then, in one black minute, it stops as though it had never begun. The door swings open, revealing her own kitchen floor. She falls out onto it, onto all fours, and into the white light that has spilled back into the room. She heaves out the torture, thick and bitter, onto her kitchen floor, and her hands stroke the normality of the lino through it, leaving trails in her own black bile. The rook upstairs goes rat-a-tat-tat, and she looks through the dirty mirror on the kitchen wall and gasps. Not at the man who had darkened her doorway, who has since vanished from the scene. Nor at the nailless tips of her bloody fingers. Nor at the whites of her eyes, now a deep blood red. But at her belly, distended and swollen. And at the claw marks and rivers of blood that streak her inner thighs. The Red Letter Dear Veronica, I know I'm not supposed to contact you at the moment, or anyone from work for that matter, and I've tried, really I have, but things aren't good here. My birds, they're all gone, all gone, all except for him, and he's very angry. I think he's done something to me, I don't know, I don't know, but I'm scared. I'm scared and I need a friend, Veronica. Please be my friend, Veronica. Please. Please. There are things I need to say to you and they can't wait. I know you see. I know what you've been doing down there in HR. And if you don't come, I'll tell. I'll tell everyone. 11.30pm. Come to the back door. Don't bring the car. All my love, I miss you. Angela. Kiss. A burning bird. She was eleven when she killed them. Three years to the day after I left her alone in that pile of bricks and secrets. They kept her in the attic, between boards and felt, between bags and boxes. A girl in storage. Early mornings, late nights. Cleaning and cooking around car parts and canisters. Scrubbing away her own evidence. That was her life. She was nothing to nobody, even then. But she had her birds. She always had her birds. They came to her through a gap in the eaves, drawn in by the tune she whistled into the wind. A tune I taught her. A tune my mother taught me. Alouette, allo, alouette, alouette. The hole in the wall brought her the stinging winter, but it also brought her company, and the birds took refuge from the storm outside, perched around her in their uneasy alliance. Her uncles worked in the yard behind the house, cutting cars in half, grinding and welding in a spray of sparks and oil. They never left the house, and when she was there, she was theirs. After school, it was always the same. They tied her to the kitchen table and stripped her and struck her and shattered her teeth for the things she hadn't done and for the things she had. I felt every blow, every touch, down here, down there, and behind the blows, behind the crack of the whip, she heard angry wings beat the air, and on it she smelled petrol and revenge. You ugly little bitch! You ugly little bird girl! Slack and northern. Words kept by time. Months went by and her child's mind made a plan. She would do it on a Saturday morning. They drank the most on Friday nights and wouldn't wake until noon, all angry and numb. She would go into town early, like she did every Saturday, and get them their bacon and tobacco. But she would take a bird her most loyal, the one that perched on her finger and who always came home. It was the night before. She had cleaned the kitchen before bed, arranging cups and saucers and exhausts and ratchets on the worktops 
and lining their petrol canisters up along the wall in the way they told her she ought to in this house of cog and oil. They had fallen asleep in their armchairs like they always did, empty beer cans strewn across the threadbare carpet, oily men with dirty hearts. They looked so small in their unconsciousness, vulnerable, with chins as weak as their desires, and for a moment she felt pity, stood in the room between them, dim light from the fading fire licking her side. Then she remembered her broken jaw, and her eyes raged red in the dark, pure with an ancient hatred. A shadow grew out of her and formed on the ceiling above, like a bird drawn badly in soot, and she made a promise to them, and to the night. She dragged her finger across the sharpness of her shattered tooth, letting her bad blood bubble up, and painted a crossed-out circle with it on both of their brows, marking them, then leaving them to their final slumber. In the attic, her bleeding finger stroked his little sparrow head, following the gentle curve, bones so light she could hardly feel them. She cried for the last time the tears of the innocent, and then fell out of the world. Angela slept a blank sleep until the morning came and peeled it off her. It was time, time to change everything. She dressed and took her bag and the meagre money they left her to do their shopping with and went downstairs, but not before she took her best bird friend from the perch at the foot of her bed and dropped him in it. He looked confused, but then he was just a bird. Tiptoeing through the kitchen, she was careful not to wake her snoring uncles her torn red leather shoes padding quietly on the cold flagged floor. She opened a window and let it swing on its hinges, then decanted a little petrol into a jar before lowering the canister onto its side where it quietly vomited its contents. The thin liquid darkened the grey flags and she pulled the door behind her, sealing them in and sealing their fates. The day hit her face. It was sunny but cold and she walked through the back streets to the one behind the butchers and knelt there in the shade. She took the bird out into the thin blue light. He had changed during his time in the bag, as if he had learned something in the dark. He didn't resist when she dipped him in the petrol, and he didn't flinch when she struck the match. And when she lit him on fire, he seemed to know that he had one last job to do, and flew up into the air burning wings leaving a cough of filthy black smoke in the clear blue sky as he made his way home. Little Angela ditched the empty jar in the undergrowth and was ordering Sunday's chicken from a man in white when the house around the corner exploded. One hammer. She is in the corner of her life. The light from the candles she lit touches the edges of the things she'll miss when she's gone. She sees a beach, tastes the salt. Knock, knock, knock. It's 11.25pm. She's early, of course. Through the texture of the opaque glass in the UPVC back door, she recognises Veronica's shape, though she's torn at the edges. Angela pats down her short, dirty nightdress and opens the door to let her in and to put her back together. There she is, whole again. My goodness, how she's missed her. Come in. Do you want a cup of tea? No, I don't. I want to get this over with and I want to go home to bed, Veronica said. Angela was surprised at the tone in her voice. Didn't she realise what was at stake? And let's put the bloody lights on, shall we? No, Angela said, leaving her seat and getting between the woman and the switch. No, I don't want the neighbours to know I'm up. Sit down, please. No, I prefer to stand. Veronica held her hand to her crooked hip. I'm not staying, Angela. Now what have you got to say? What did she have to say? For all her planning, she had thought very little about how this might actually play out, and she hadn't expected her to be so touchy. She expected her to be at least a little happy to see her, ask how she'd been doing, perhaps. But that definitely wasn't the case. 
and it was clear that she wasn't in the least bit interested in Angela, her life, or her loneliness. Well, I saw you the other day, the day I left work early, she started. This was awkward. Angela didn't have the words to describe the things she saw in that grubby little cubicle without showing some emotion and playing her hand. OK, and what did you see? Now Veronica's tone was inquisitive, mocking almost, as though it was Angela who was on trial here, as though it was her who had put her own filth and lust over everything else. And here, in the wilds of Angela's kitchen, Veronica's mask was slipping, and Angela found she was afraid of the person behind it. It scared her to see there was fire behind those tired eyes. I thought I knew you. The words left Angela's trembling lips and the energy in the room changed around them. The candles flickered and upstairs something went rat-a-tat-tat. Oh, Angela, stop this stupid bloody game. We get it. You're lonely, but I'm married and I'm not into rat-a-tat-tat. I don't think of you, rat-a-tat-tat. What is that bloody noise? Veronica broke off, wandering away from Angela towards the stairs, towards the... No, Angela said. Don't go upstairs. She considered running ahead, blocking her way, making an excuse for the noise upstairs, but Veronica's words still reverberated through her, cloying at her soul, pecking at her heart. No, she would let her see. It was time for her to meet him. She heard her footfall on the first tread. Angela, what is all this? And Angela knew she'd got to the wall of bones. She'd already seen too much. Angela picked up the hammer from the bottom of the stairs and started up behind her. Oh, Angela! Ha 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 ha! Veronica laughed. Laughter? What was she laughing at? Not the remains of her birds, surely. Not her friends, all dead and pale and beautiful. She would take shock, fear even, but humour? No. There was no humour to be found here. Angela, what is all this? She laughed again. How dare she? The curtain dropped. Angela, you filthy cow! How could you? I knew you were bloody mad, but really, this? Ha! Now I know why your clothes always smell the way they do. Bird shit everywhere. She spun around, taking it all in seeing behind the lace, not registering the rusty, blood-stained hammer that swung at Angela's cottage cheese thigh. And what are these? She flicked on the light. Boxes? Is that my name on there? And Janet? Her eyes were wide now, her teeth showing all yellow and brown. She opened Janet and peered into her, lifting up the wig and the wool. You're mad, Angela! Absolutely fucking mad. Oh my God, they are going to love this at work. And then came the immortal line Angela just couldn't hear. Is it any wonder you're on your... But she didn't finish the thought. The hammer entered Veronica's head from the right-hand side and pushed her eyeball forward and dropped her jaw. It dropped too low and yawned a scream as her head came apart and her brain dribbled down her shoulder. She wheeled, spinning and moaning like a record playing backwards, while blood pumped in big glugs out of the hole Angela had made in her head, painting her wall of bones with a streak of beautiful crimson. Veronica's remaining eye spun in its socket, looking for logic in this new world, but the wretched woman got herself wrong, trying to sit down, trying to stand up, waving at the wall of bones, her brain of very little use where it lay on the floor. Oh, she slurred, clutching her broken face. And this is long. And Angela was here and there, happy and sad, not yet bereft, but at once annoyed with Veronica's stupid dance, which trailed and stumbled about, rising and falling, choking and gurgling. She watched Veronica make one last pirouette, then with a twist, a frown, and half a smile. She knocked her in the wet head once more, and the once beautiful girl from work hit the floor for the last time. Oh, Veronica, 
Oh, Veronica, what has happened to you? Angela said as she knelt at her side, swaying back and forth, holding the hands of her dead boss, wiping the blood from her hammer and her hands on the pale blue nightdress that stuck to her clammy thighs. Let me see, she said, and took off all her clothes. There was no beauty left, just age and surgical scars. It was too late in every possible sense. Life had gone by so fast, so fast. And here she was at the end of Veronica's. She had waited too long to hold her like this. It was nothing like she'd imagined in their twenties, or thirties, or forties. Sat there in an expanding pool of the object of her affection, she cries a deep cry, an underground cry, a cry from before there were words. And she wishes she had understood sooner that beauty drains away with every passing day, and the longer you hesitate to take the things you want, the poorer the reward when you do. Days pass, the way days do, and Veronica becomes a space in people's lives. The man she married presumes she has finally left him and doesn't chase her. He is too exhausted by his shame and suspicion. And the son she loved don't ask where his mother is, because what Angela can't know is that his father is home to a terrible rage. And it was this that drove his wife into the arms and bed of that other man. A man that listened and cared and touched her gently. A man without blackbirds in his veins. At home, Angela listens to the radio talk of an epidemic. Airborne, they say. She keeps the windows shut, wears a mask. The smell of rot fills the house, and the six weeks of her suspension expire. At work she sits at her desk and listens to the people who still turn up wonder where Veronica is. But there are so many off sick that it doesn't seem as important as it once would. And besides, there is so much work to do now, and with so few people there isn't even time to think. And so Veronica is buried, not by dirt in a churchyard, but by circumstance. The people at work can't know that her broken body is laid out on a trestle table in Angela's second bedroom. Her arms spread wide, but crooked like broken wings, being picked over by a ragged blackbird with a dirty old soul. They couldn't imagine the wig she wears that has been combed and trimmed in pursuit of a bygone beauty, or the way her flesh comes so easily from her spongy bones. They can't imagine the deep obsidian seam that runs through the bedrock of families like ours, or the horrors that take place on the other side of the walls they share with us, or in the shadows at the bottom of their boring gardens. Because Angela is not alone, and nature has a dark heart. The Ditch Memorandum Due to the ongoing health crisis and the advice of the WHO, the senior management team has decided to suspend operations until such time that the avian flu epidemic has passed. Key positions will continue to operate from home and can be contacted by email. The company will pay you at full rate for the first two weeks of the suspension and after that, any outstanding annual leave and sickness allowance will be used until none remains. It is our hope that operations will resume prior to such times. We urge you to stay indoors. The Senior Management Team Angela read the email and knew that it was over. She wouldn't be coming back. The winter sun could barely look at her through the dirty office window. It knew as well as she did that today was the last day. She packed her desk. In the back of the bottom drawer was a stack of Christmas cards from Veronica. She flicked through them. 1978, 1985, 1999, 2008. Years gone by. Years gone by. Her eyes fell on the empty desk to her left, and she said she was sorry. Goodbye. She was the only person on the platform. A grey wind blew through it and brought an empty train. She saw the driver. He didn't look well. She was home. She felt his presence bearing down from the second bedroom. 
She hadn't fed him in days, but it didn't matter. He didn't need it any more. He never did. Akakakak! That guttural machine gun. He was calling her. She climbed the stairs, her head low. Please don't, she said to herself. Her hands found the wall and saw for her as her eyes filled with salt water. I taste it on her lips. Please don't. She stood at the top of the stairs between the two bedrooms, in her macabre ivory church, and looked through her tears and the screen door and the lace curtain. He was there, in the shadow of her crime, stood on the gleaming white skull he had made his nest, eye holes and jaw stuffed with feather and straw, trimmed wig off to one side. Come in, he said in her mind. Look at her. She is beautiful again. Angela pushed the screen door open and stepped into him. The birds had all gone now, just their beaks and skulls remained, crushed and scattered about like a beach of broken bone. And in the centre, there she was. And he was right. She was beautiful again. Angela walked around the trestle table, taking her in. Veronica's old bones were bright and clean and even the pale sun was compelled to look through the glass square in the sloped ceiling. She traced her outline with her finger, down her smooth tibia, past the metal knuckle in her hip, and round the inside of her pelvis. Old curves, new beauty. She held the framework of her hand, but it fell apart in her own. With the wrinkled skin gone, she was new again, reborn, Angela kissed the hand that wrote her disciplinaries, then the radius, then the humorous. She let her eyes close and her tongue felt its way between her ribs and over her clavicle, where she could still taste the petals in her perfume, the same one she wore every day for thirty-eight years, indelible on her ivory after all that time. Her face pressed into the place where the flesh of her neck once was, and she imagined its resistance, its reassurance. I wish we'd danced, she whispered into her spine, and it collapsed away from her, taking her ribcage down with it, falling like a tired city. The rook opened his big torn wings and flapped them slowly, his eyes wide and deep and empty. The air moved and the bones fell some more until it was hard to make out the shape of the matchstick woman on the table. Finally, Angela was bereft. No, no! She held her up, realigned the balls and joints, but the tighter she held her, the more she came apart, until Veronica was just swirling dust and a pile of bones. Angela scooped them up in her arms. She had to take her away from him. He didn't love her. He didn't love at all. He just wanted the pain, and he'd had it. He'd had it in spades. She took the bones downstairs in bundles and laid them out on the kitchen unit and he watched through the walls as she went outside and began digging the ditch. The spade was cold in her hands, and the force of her feet and the metal cut a rectangle in the tilted earth. The soil built up on either side as Angela sank lower and lower into the grave she was digging. She sliced through root and worm as they came to the surface, jerking blind and erratic. As she got deeper, the soil became more cloying, thick and damp and dense and she herself became more frantic. A new strength in her shoulders flicked the dirt up onto the pile. It coated her hands and stuck in her hair until her face was blackened and her eyes reddened by it. The sky went dark. A sound like a million rustling papers took to the twilight. Above her, a cloud of bird, a smoke of starling, a shade of wings. She looked up at it, wiping a little fat hand across her eyes, clearing a streak of dirt so she saw through a white flash of moon-pale skin. The birds above her came apart and coalesced. One, millions, more. The cloud was so big it came low and she heard through the fluttering paper to an anger beneath. Violence was at the centre of this, nature's dark heart. It swelled and pumped larger and larger, and when it could hold no more, it rained its weak dead element down on her, tiny ragged birds falling onto her, 
gored and bloody. Beauty is a matter of perspective. From the right point in time and space, anything can be beautiful. And from the hill behind the house, the birds formed a shape, circles and lines splitting themselves into twos and fours and sixes with their own perfect symmetry. A target, perhaps. A symbol, certainly. But beneath it, up close where Angela stood, it was a scythe, slashing, spinning, shredding itself, beaks and claws tearing beak from claw. The shape hung in the air, over the town, over what was left of her life. She ran from the starling storm, taking shelter from it in the house she had called her home, and stood at its kitchen sink as the kettle rattled in its cradle, barely containing the rage boiling within. Three heaped spoonfuls of glinting white rubble fell from a spoon held with shaking hands into the bottom of a tea-stained mug, her favourite. Princess Diana's faded face smiled meekly from within a blue crest. Tea, water, milk and sugar did their alchemy and gave her what weak reassurance they could. She sipped it. It was too hot. It burned her lips. A laundry basket overflowed in the corner of the kitchen. She tipped out its contents. It was Natalie, wig and all, dirty and stained, and beneath her was Janet, resplendent in denim and wool. She hugged them to her chest. Girls, girls together. She pulled Natalie's red hair over her own black mop and looked in the dusty mirror on the kitchen wall. She was her own monster. Her black face, a sharp beak, a head of flames. Her eyes murdered her through the grime. Fear and solitude, all of it, all the world had to offer. She took Veronica's femur from the worktop and swung it at the menace in the mirror. It cracked a star that reflected her back in triangular elements. One part fire, one part dirt, one part bone. She took off her clothes and dithered into Janet's wool and denim, then looked out of the window over the yellowing bones on the worktop and out into the wild of the garden where the birds still circled their black sign over her deep, dark ditch. She could see its maw, gaping, inviting. Behind the circle of birds that blackened the sky, the clouds rolled purple and blue over the sun's burst eye. A tear swelled at the corner of her own and coursed a rosacea path through the dirt that covered her face, while the eye in the sky threatened to do the same. The time was now. It always had been. Veronica's bones made morbid music as Angela dropped them into the laundry basket, and she clutched it tight and went outside. She knelt in the soil piled up on the high side of the hole, piled around the lips of the dirty mouth that wanted to kiss her, wind and rain whipping their lash. She wiped Natalie's red hair from her wet eyes and tucked it behind her little ears without looking at the birds and clouds that blackened the sky. She laid Veronica down in neat lines, parallel, organised. It's what she would have wanted. The skull she held up to the sky, pulling the fuzzy grey feathers and straw out of its crevices and looked through its eyes into the place where her love had lived. It was too small in there to hold all that love too tight inside that cracked cranium to hold all their experience. A strange purple light came in through the hole the hammer had made, Angela's entrance and Veronica's exit. Veronica's old jaw hung low at one side in a long slur. She held it closed. Don't speak, she whispered into the wind, and they kissed, finally. A tear dropped out of the sky and ran down her cheek then another and another. The twilight eye cried on her, its tears becoming indistinguishable from the storm in her eyes. Let's go to bed, she said to her dead friend's head, and it smiled back at her. She climbed down and they lay together in the dirty black bed she had dug for them in the earth, and she watched through wet and absent eyes as the span of the sky spun overhead, birds dipping low, rain falling through them. The water drained the dirt into their bed, filling it up, touching her sides until she could feel it in her ears. And the storm of starlings came so close that some fell in, kamikaze, 
filling in the gaps between her legs and Veronica's bones. They fell into Natalie's red hair and got caught in Janet's woolen jumper, where they twitched, then gave up as bird, dirt and water formed a calcium mud. It was thick and it was gritty and it covered her ears as the tempest above gave itself to her. Still more birds came. This could be all the birds there are, she thought to herself, and smiled. They have all come for me. More birds dropped onto her, pelting her body, their beaks tearing at Janet's denim and then Angela's white skin. And with more birds came more dirt, some washed in by the downpour, some flicked in by the wings that skimmed the ground. Then she saw him, sat in the tree at the end of the garden, his head cocked, one red eye on her black hole. I'm leaving you, she said, and when he laughed his bitter laugh, it burned her brain like battery acid, searing a white light behind eyes that watched him fly away, a diminishing V-shape convulsing in the purple sky. She bled into the filth through dirty punctures and the earth fell on her in sods, pressure building, holding her down. She didn't struggle, she wanted this. Bird and dirt fell on her head and she lost the sky. She felt the strange weight of it all against her eyeballs and the sharp grit and twitching mulch fill her throat. She breathed in one last time and took the earth into herself. She was underground. They were quiet, those last few moments. Yes, her throat gagged and lurched in reflex, and her heart pumped what oxygen it could find around the body she had been cursed into. But she herself found that peaceful place from before she was born. And finally, the dark light died. Finally, she fell asleep, and it was the deep kind of sleep. The kind you escape into. The kind I'll never know, because I see all this through his sleepless grid where time meets space. Where they cut each other in half. Where things are made of knives and chaos. Years pass, grass grows. She rots a little, then a lot. Her cells become spores, become knowledge. Nature eats her and reads her. Overhead, stars shatter and worlds end. Heat unimaginable cracks infinite emptiness. Hair, flesh, bone and feather. They spin through the screaming vacuum, clashing and fracturing. Their particles, forced together, fuse into something else. Something old. Something new. A cerise crystal shaped like a rough heart. This has been Angela, written by Adam M. Booth, narrated by Rob Gull. Copyright 2014 by Adam M. Booth. Production copyright 2015 by Adam M. Booth.